Welcome to the Together for Good podcast brought to you by Bethany Lutheran Church in Cherry Hills Village, Colorado. On today's episode, we have a Bible study, but it's on a topic that I'm guessing you've not had a Bible study on before. Today we're talking about exorcisms. There are many stories within the Gospels where Jesus casts out demons. But what are we supposed to make of that today? What are we supposed to think about these stories? Keep listening, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. This is a spooky topic, uh, but we have a very hopeful episode. Because after all, Jesus always defeats the forces of evil. So without further ado, here's this Bible study on exorcisms. I'd like to talk with you today about a topic that appears in our scriptures a decent number of times, and yet it's a topic that we really don't seem to address or cover or explore very much these days, partially because it's a really strange topic. I'm talking, of course, about exorcisms. <laughs> I know, you haven't thought about exorcisms in a while, and really, exorcisms just seem like something that Hollywood will take care of. They've got all those movies about the exorcist and the exorcism of Emily Rose and whatever other new horror movie might be coming out. It's a fantastic setting for a horror movie, of course, but what in the world do exorcisms have to deal with today? How are we supposed to understand this idea of a person being possessed by a demon? It just seems like something that doesn't happen anymore. Certainly, the Lutheran Church, I was never trained in the art of exorcism. I do believe Catholic priests may still receive that type of training, uh, but it's certainly not as common as it was thousands of years ago. And so what are we to make of it? And more importantly, what do we do with the fact that the Gospels contain seven different stories of Jesus performing an exorcism? How are we supposed to understand that? I'm hoping to encourage you to ask questions like these, not just about exorcism, but with anything we encounter in Scripture. Just because we might come across a story that seems uh, antiquated, that seems old-fashioned, that seems out of touch with modern times and current science, that doesn't mean that we should just disregard it and ignore it. As you'll see as we go through this exorcism story I'm about to share, even when the topic may seem a little out of joint with our current understanding of reality, the truth is there is still so much wisdom in there. There's still things being taught to us about the nature of God and our life of faith that we can uncover by just giving some time and approach and care to these stories. And this is, of course, true for exorcism as well. The thing is, if you were to describe Jesus, think about this, right? You want to describe Jesus and give him a title. What would, what would be a title that you would want to give Jesus? What, well, you'd probably say, oh, Jesus is Lord. Good, right? We say that all the time on Sunday morning. Or Jesus is our Savior. Great. Well, let's dig a little deeper. What are some other items that you could list on Jesus' resume? He's a teacher because he taught all the time, didn't he? In the synagogues and on the hillsides. Jesus was a healer who often healed people of their ailments. He was a prophet. He was a community organizer. He was a rabbi. And he was an exorcist. It's not one that we usually attach, again, because we're really uncomfortable with this term and with these stories. But it's very clear this is one of the key jobs that Jesus did. He came to cast out demons. And there's a couple passages in the scripture where the chief priests or the Pharisees or the Roman authorities even kind of attach this title to Jesus. They say, here comes Jesus of Nazareth casting out demons. That's part of how he was known back in the day. And so again, if this is a, a title of Jesus, part of his job description, I think we need to take care to pay attention to this. We need to do some digging and think about what does it mean to say that our Savior Jesus was an exorcist. There's a famous psychologist, Carl Jung. Um, I really like a lot of his writings, to be honest. And he said, 
the old gods didn't die. They just became illnesses. The old gods didn't die. They just became illnesses. One of the things we need to realize is that science and faith can still work together in real ways. And what we need to remember is that the Bible was written at a time when science wasn't very advanced. When people's worldview and understanding of how the world worked isn't nearly as complex and integrated as it is today. And so when people wrote these stories down, they had a particular way of seeing and understanding the world. They didn't have language to describe all the different diseases that we now know about today. And so there's the very good chance that many of the demon-possessed people that we encounter in the scripture passages, there's a real chance that if they were around today, perhaps a doctor would be able to diagnose them with a mental illness or a physical ailment. Who really knows? But that's just one way for us to start thinking about what these passages mean and how we can understand them in 2020. The other piece that we need to recognize and understand is that those who were demon-possessed are clearly connected with forces of evil. That just seems to go hand in hand. In this day and age, um, right? I, I want you to separate those two ideas, too, from one another. The, the first one that I said about maybe some of the demon possession is just a form of illness today. But in the same sense, also, maybe demon possession is the presence of evil. I'm not saying that those are the two exactly the same, but these are two different ways of possibly explaining what demon possession might look like in this day and age. I'm going to get into this idea of demon possession and evil going hand in hand a little bit more later because I think as we look at this passage from Matthew 8 and one of Jesus' exorcisms, you'll begin to see what I'm talking about, about how the evil forces that are at work in our world in 2020 in some ways resemble some of the things that we see in those who are demon possessed in the scripture passage that we read. So just wanted to start with that long introduction I know um, about all of this before we even get into the scripture passage, but I hope you found it interesting and it's at least opening your mind to some of these ideas, just different ways to be thinking about these stories that we encounter. So the scripture passage that I want to talk about today is Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34, just a short six verses here. And I want to just read it for you. And we're just going to go verse by verse because there's so much baked into these six verses that I want to kind of break down as we go through. When Jesus came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demonics coming out of the tombs met him. They were so fierce that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they shouted, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a large herd of swine was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, If you cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And so Jesus said to them, Go. So they came out and entered the swine, and suddenly the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. The swine herds ran off, and on going into the town they told the whole story about what had happened to the demonics. Then the whole town came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their neighborhood. So that's the whole story. I know I said I was going to read verse by verse, but I just got going and got excited by it. That's the whole story, just to give you a picture of it. But it starts with Jesus going to the country of the Gadarenes, it says. All that you need to know about that town is that it was a Gentile area. This is the other side of the tracks. That's what Matthew, the gospel writer, wants us to know, is that Jesus is going to the other place, the place where the Jews don't live, in unfamiliar territory where Jesus might not be fully welcome. That's where the story is happening. And upon entering this Gentile area, what Jesus discovers, he, he encounters two demonics who are coming out of the tombs. You see, to choose to live in the tombs that were hewn out of the rocks of the sides 
this was a sign of insanity at that time. No one would willingly live there. And so it's very clear that these two demonics have been cast out of their community. They've been put in a place in the town where no one would normally live. And so probably these two demonics, their actions are described also as being very, very fierce and, and that no one could pass by. They were sent out to the caves because they were dan a danger to the community. And so these are the people that Jesus encounters upon entering this new Gentile area. And their behavior, the two demonics' behavior, it must have been self-destructive. It was, again, as I said, a danger to the community. And yet they were trapped by it. They couldn't prevent this type of behavior from happening. This is part of the demon possession. The community had no idea how to fix the problem. They were scared of these people, so they just sent them off elsewhere where no one would rather live. Now, I want us to think about that. In our world today, don't we have individuals who we just cast off? We make them live in places where no one else would want to live just because we don't know how to deal with them. One of the things that really comes to my mind is all of the problems we're seeing in our world with the opioid crisis, where you have people who have become addicted to these drugs and it's affecting their behavior. It's making it so that they can no longer fully function in the community. And so they end up homeless, living in places where no one else would rather live. They're so tied up inside by their addiction to this drug that they can't be a part of the community anymore. I think we're beginning to see, right? Maybe the ways that these demonics in this Gentile area are being described, it's really not that different than the struggles that individuals are going through with the opioid crisis. We have to be careful, too, and recognize that Jesus... You know, we're talking about them as the demonics, but Jesus has compassion for these people. And Jesus does something to bring real healing to these individuals. And so I think we could do the same is to have compassion for those who are struggling with addiction. And, and rather than just stigmatizing them and, and sending them off to a place that's outside of community, how can we find a way to bring compassion and healing to those people? Moving along, though, in the passage, notice that the demons who Jesus encounters, they recognize who he is. They say to him, they say, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? No one in the scriptures tends to recognize or understand Jesus's mission. The disciples are often all out of sorts and not understanding what Jesus' mission is all about. But the demons get it. And this is part of the way that Matthew writes his whole gospel. Is it's Matthew's gospel is all about the, the struggle between good and evil. And so this conversation here, it is Jesus and the forces of evil meeting, right? <laughs> meeting in a place and it's very clear that they are from different realms. The possessed men seem to know that the Son of Man is coming to destroy them. But they weren't thinking that that day would be today. But that's how Jesus' power works. It happens right now in, in different ways that we can't fully understand. But it is breaking in when we least expect it. And now keep in mind, we need to separate the men who were possessed by the demon from the demon itself. The demon itself is the force that Jesus is working against, but the men who have been possessed by this demon are the individuals that Jesus has, has compassion for. So all of it is to say is that evil and good are meeting in this place, and Jesus is coming to declare victory over the evil to bring healing to these men who are demon-possessed. This is good news for us today, for those who are struggling with a demon-like addiction. That is something that Jesus can come to bring healing to right now. But now moving on in the passage to look at this next session, there's a herd of swine 
that's feeding at some distance. And keep in mind, pigs, right, swine, are considered unclean to those who are Jewish. But remember, this is a Gentile area, so it makes sense that there might be swine around. It's also Matthew just drawing our attention to Jesus is in a part of town that isn't his normal part of town. And it's very strange that Jesus and the demon have a conversation. And Jesus makes a deal with the demons, right? The demons say, hey, cast us out into that herd of swine. And so Jesus just says, go. And so the, demon leave, the demons leave the men and enter the swine. And then the swine run off a cliff. Now, you've got to remember that this herd of swine was probably someone's livelihood. They were raising these pigs to eat, to sell, and Jesus just destroyed the economy of this small town with that action. But this is also part of Jesus' message. Because elsewhere in Matthew's gospel, Jesus makes it very clear that one cannot serve God and money. You see, Jesus is trying to help this town see that they care more about their economic livelihood than they do about these two men who they cast off from the community and sent to live in a cave. That also is an exorcism that Jesus is performing. Jesus is trying to cast out the demon of greed and the worship of money that lives within this town. Jesus is trying to help that community discover that caring for their people is more important than being wealthy. And of course, we can see how this idea of exorcism is a work that Jesus is still <laughs> performing today. Our worship of money and our insistence upon it is something that is more clear than ever. And I think we can all come up with a host of examples of the ways of that evil taking root and leading our communities to make terrible decisions. When people become possessed by the demon of greed, their actions often completely disregard the care of others. That's what happened way back in Matthew chapter 8. That community didn't care about these two demonic possessed men. They sent them to go live in a cave, to just be out of sight and out of mind, not our problem. And then when Jesus comes along to heal them, the community's more concerned with about the loss of pigs than they are about the health and well-being of these two men. In our world today, people often care more about their 401ks than they do about caring for those who are really struggling in our society, in our world. This is part of the message of Jesus. It's part of his work as an exorcist. And it can be hard to hear. Uh, and yet, it's also hard to deny that this is the way that Jesus worked. I want to just leave you with all of these thoughts and with a recognition that, yeah, exorcism is something that's very strange. And, and yet when we start to look at it in a bigger picture, there are still evil forces at work in our world. And when we think about it that way, it's not hard to name and call out the evil that exists around us. And then to recognize that Jesus calls us to cast out those demons to work to bring light and wholeness and healing to the places where evil is winning. You can do this in so many ways. By showing love and compassion for someone who's forgotten. By reaching out and caring more about the needs of a person than necessarily your own wealth and comfort. All of these are ways that exorcism still happens. In fact, exorcism still happens whenever we have a baptism. At a baptism, we ask, do you denounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? You see, as baptized Christians, we die to an old way of life, and then we are raised to new life in Christ. And we're called to then continue that pattern of casting out evil 
and bringing about new life. So I hope this gives you some new perspective and some new ideas about exorcism and how it might actually relate to what's going on in our world today. How it's not just old stories, but how there's real deep wisdom in these scripture passages that maybe at first seem a little peculiar. I'm Pastor Nate. This has been the Bethany Together for Good podcast. Thanks for listening. Stay in peace.